Hello, crime historians, and welcome back to another episode of a crime story podcast. I'm your host, Kaylin Lois. I'm originally from the United States of America, Texas to be exact, and in 2018, I moved to France. When I moved here, I just started hearing all of these insane crime stories, so I started researching them and learning the different avenues to justice, and I decided to tell you all about it and created this podcast. The crime story today is a case about a 16-year-old boy whose freedom was stolen from him because of his simple routines. I first heard about this case when I was telling a friend here in France about the Innocence Project in the United States. I asked him if there were any big cases in France where someone was wrongfully accused, and he said, unfortunately, yes. The case of Patrick Dills. When he recounted the crime story to me, I was dumbfounded and I knew I had to do more research. This is the story of the 1986 murder of two young boys, the wrongful conviction of a 16-year-old boy, and who really committed the crime. Episode 20 covers the case of Francis wrongfully accused and the criminal Batpacker. This is their crime story. Just a bit of a warning before I hop into this episode that it discusses crimes against children. Listener discretion is advised. Now, I have covered a number of French crimes on this podcast. Since I am living in France, I speak and read a bit of French, and I understand the culture around crime here. But just a bit of a refresher since it's been a couple of episodes since I've covered the French legal system. France runs on the civil law system, which means the laws are codified, aka written down. Therefore, you break a law, the courts do not look at case precedent, but determine if you broke the codified law. France has an unfortunately long history of the wrongfully convicted. Starting all the way back when the Joan of Arc was posthumously exonerated in 1456 for the 1431 crime of heresy. According to a simple search on Wikipedia, there have been five more notable wrongful convictions in France since the Joan of Arc case. One of these being our crime story today. The crime story today starts in the town of montigny les metz which is in the Grand East region of France in the Moselle department. For my non-French listeners, the town is located in the upper northeast corner of France, just kind of under Luxembourg. In 1986, the population was just around 22,000 people. Even though montigny les metz is small, it is right next to the city Metz, which has a population of around 100,000. Therefore, I would say it's safe to say that montigny les metz is a part of a bigger metropolis area. On Sunday, September 28, 1986, two eight-year-old boys, Cheville Bendin and Alexandre Beckrick, were our neighbors who left their homes around 5 p.m. to go ride their bikes around the town. They had a particular spot where they liked to ride, which was about a kilometer behind their house, where a few SNCF trains were held when they were not in use. When the boys had not returned home an hour later, their parents started to worry and went looking for them, but to no avail. And when they couldn't still find them an hour after, they contacted the authorities around 7.10 p.m. At 7.30 p.m., a police officer discovered the lifeless bodies of Cheryl and Alexandre. Both boys were on their backs at the foot of an embankment. Signs of homicide were apparent because their skulls were smashed in with rocks. Alexandre's pants were lowered to mid-thigh, and Cheryl's head was sunken 10 centimeters into itself. Though the attack may have had a sexual motive to it, the boys were not subjected to any sexual violence. This crime was obviously savage, and it seems to me to be a crime of opportunity. I don't know if this was the boys' set routine to ride their bikes every Sunday at 5 p.m., but you have to remember this is a small town, and this was in the late 80s, so I'm sure they felt perfectly safe riding their bikes, and their parents had no reservations about them doing so. The boys' parents could have never imagined when they said yes to allowing their sons to play that fateful day that it would have been the last time that they ever saw them alive. The boys' funerals were held a couple of days later on October 2nd, 1986. 
The investigation on who committed this heinous crime started immediately, which was led by Commissioner Binad Vallet. They interviewed several suspects, including one of the boy's neighbors, a 16-year-old apprentice chef named Patrick Dills. But the investigation did not really have a clear direction to it. Some neighbors said to the police that Patrick Dills walked every day by this portion of the railway that the boys were riding their bikes the day of the murder, and he also didn't get along well with with the kids. In France, the police can arrest you without the charge of a crime and only the suspicion of a crime, but they can only hold you for 48 hours. Based off this information, the police arrested Patrick Dills on October 1st, 1986, a day before the funeral and questioned him based off the tips from the neighbors, but soon let him go because he had a strong alibi. He was staying with his relatives at the family's country house in Donville. They returned to montigny le metz at 6.45 p.m., which was after the murders took place, which was believed to be around 5 to 5.30 p.m. With outcry from the public to make an arrest, the investigators persisted. Around 500 people were interviewed and even two suspects confessed in police custody before retracting and no charges were brought to them. On April 28, 1987, the forensic-slash-medical examiner declared that the kids died at another time than was initially reported. It was actually probably closer to 7 p.m. A couple that lived 200 meters from the crime scene told the police that they heard children crying around 6 55 p.m. and that they saw Patrick Dills near the scene. Now keep in mind that Patrick Dills did walk home from school every day on this path, but the crime took place on a Sunday, therefore he wasn't at school, and he said he just got back from his vacation home with his family. Plus, Patrick had an alibi that he was at his family's country house, but the family was at their home in montigny le metz at 6.45 p.m., and now the time of death was believed to be 6.55 to 7 o'clock p.m., which leaves a pretty tight window to find the boys and commit the crime, in my opinion, but four of the lifeless bodies were found at 7.30 p.m. Nevertheless, the police did not see Patrick as having a good alibi due to the new events and re-arrested him at his work and Patrick was interrogated. The police told Patrick that he would get to see his parents again if he told him he was the killer. After more than 48 hours straight of interrogation at the police station, Patrick admitted to the murders and stated that he did not know the reason for the crime. Patrick later recounted this because he was scared, he was exhausted, he did not know that he had the right to get a lawyer, he missed his parents, he just said whatever the police told him to say so that he could go back home. On April 30th, 1987, Patrick was formally charged with voluntary homicide and sent to the prison and sent to a prison of Metz, Guadeloupe. He gave a different version of offense to his appointed attorney at the prison. The lawyer wanted to organize a crime scene reconstruction with the police and Patrick to prove that Patrick had no inside knowledge into the crime. At the reconstruction, the investigative judge asked Patrick what rocks he would have grabbed to kill the boys. Patrick immediately took rocks from where the police thought that the murder weapon was found. This convinced the investigative judge of Patrick's guilt. His lawyer did not have any card in hand to prove Patrick's innocence. The police and the judge believed he was guilty despite the inconsistencies that remained around his timeline of the murder and the difficulty that the teenager may have had in causing extreme violence that was perpetrated on the victims. When Patrick's parents requested a permit to visit their son in prison between the found guilt and the sentencing, the judge refused to allow visits. For 16 months, the only person Patrick saw from the outside of prison was his lawyer. On January 27, 1989, Patrick was sentenced to life in prison by the juvenile Court des Essences of Moselle. The French law at the time would have allowed Patrick, being a minor, to reduce the sentence to a maximum of 25 years. However, the fact that Patrick was a minor was just simply ignored. The victim's parents said that they would have preferred the death penalty for Patrick Dills, but the death penalty was abolished in France 
for minors in 1980 and then fully in 1981. Patrick Sawyer in 1990 filed a review of Corte de Cassation. A Corte de Cassation is kind of equivalent to what the appeal process is in the United States. The Corte de Cassation is not judging the evidence of a crime, but judging the investigative procedure and the court procedure. Patrick filed this on the ground of not knowing his right to a lawyer during questioning, but this was ultimately denied. Patrick also asked for a presidential pardon in 1994, but the French president at the time, Francois Mintignol, refused to. Mintignol even wrote to the victim's family and assured them that he would never grant clemency to a murderer of children. It looked like Patrick Dills was in prison for life. <laughs> In 1997, an investigator in Rennes, Brittany, France, named Jean-Francois Abgel was working on a case for a suspected serial killer named Francis Homme. Francis Homme was born in 1959 in Metz, France, which is the big city next to Montigny-les-Metz. Francis did not have the best childhood due to an alcoholic abusive father and low intelligence. In fact, he was nicknamed in his youth as Félix Le Chat, or Felix the cat because he liked to eat cat food. Francis had Kilfelter syndrome, which means that he had two or more X chromosomes on his sex chromosome, which leads to fertility issues and poorly functioning testicles. When Francis grew up, he found that he had a passion for biking and travel, and he would travel around France via walking, hitchhiking, cycling, and on the train without a ticket. He would stay in shelters, psychiatric institutions, and deep toxification centers, earning money through odd jobs, and then spending what little money he made on alcohol. Francis committed his first murder against a 17-year-old three weeks after the death of his mother in 1984. In mid-1986, Francis went to live with his grandmother near montigny le metz While there, he was working as a laborer for a company that was located just 400 meters from the crime scene of Cheryl and Alexandre. Now, Francis committed many crimes, not all that we know of, but we do know that several times he would involve accomplices in his crimes. His accomplices would perform a sexual act on the victim, and then Francis would finish them off. Now, the investigator out of Rennes, Brittany, France, uh, Jean-Francois took charge of a sting of crimes in Brittany that seemed to have a familiar pattern to them. His investigation led him to Francis Holm, in whom he managed to come into contact with. Despite the lack of a support from his superiors, Jean-Francois understood what he was doing and what it could lead to. While Jean-Francois continued to investigate, Francis was committing more and more murders. Francis Holm was finally arrested on August 7, 1992. Investigators tried to connect all the dots of Francis Holm's crimes across France, but it was not an easy feat. The guy was believed to have been committing murders from 1984 to 1992 across 35 departements in France. Moreover, negligence, shortcomings, and poor coordination on a various local investigation services made the investigation just that much harder. It was finally Jean-Francois Abgil who created a detailed timeline of the murders according to the movements of Francis Holm and sent centralized various investigations. He was able to speak to Francis, who confessed to about 15 pepins, which translates to glitches. Francis also admitted to murdering medical personnel who did not believe him because he was known to be like this extravagant storyteller who just didn't speak the truth ever. Francis Holm describes his victims as men, women, and children of all ages. Their only common point was crossing Francis when he saw red. So basically, Francis Holm was not a great guy. He was a true serial killer who liked to kill simply to kill and to feel control. Now, during all the investigations, Francis Holm confessed to a murder in the south of France in which the victim was killed by rocks, which made investigators question if he could have been the true murderer of the boys in Montigny-les-Metz. 
1997, Francis confessed to killing the eight-year-old neighbor's boys, Cherie and Alexandre, in montigny le metz In fact, Francis was even questioned in 1986 for the murders, but was quickly ruled out for whatever reason. I guess they just had tunnel vision for Patrick Dills at the time. In 1998, Patrick Dill's lawyer filed a new request for review after learning that the serial killer Francis Holm was working near the scene of the crime at the time of the facts, which constitutes, quote, a new fact to raise doubts. In 1999, a commission agreed to submit the file to the criminal chamber at the Cour de Cassation, which ordered a further investigation on June 28, 2000. On November 30, 2000, the court for the review of the criminal convictions annuls Patrick Till's sentence to life imprisonment, but refuses to release him pending on new judgment before another court that specializes in minors, even though Patrick Dills was now 31 years old. On June 20th, 2001, a new trial was ordered. Patrick told the court about the horrors of prison, the rapes he endured in prison, and the abuse and bullying that he was subjected to those accused of infanticide. On June 29th, although the Avocat General requested an acquittal, he was found guilty and his life sentence became 25 years of criminal imprisonment. So, one court found him guilty, one said, oh, you're still guilty, but we're going to take the life sentence and give you 25 years. Like, are you mad? Because I am. An appeal was filed in the court for minors in Lyon, France. In this court, Patrick explained that he was subjected to psychological pressure during the interrogations preceding the confession extracted from a 16-year-old kid. His lawyer, as well as the police, produced evidence showing that Patrick Dills did not have time to commit the crime, that the children died around 5 p.m. while Patrick Dills did not return to his home in montigny le metz until 6.45 p.m. On April 24, 2002, five years after Francis Holmes' confession to the murders in montigny le metz Patrick's innocence was finally recognized and he was released from prison after 15 years. This acquittal and release were understandably controversial and some still believe that Patrick was the murderer and the lawyer took the opportunity to overthrow public opinion to obtain an acquittal. Some of the French public concur while the geographical proximity to Francis home during this period of the murder is disturbing, but it only appears to be an unfortunate coincidence. On March 31st, 2014, 28 years after the initial murder, a new trial starts regarding the murders of Cyril Benin and Alexandre Beckrich, where Francois at home claimed innocence, even though he confessed. On May 17, 2017, the official trial for the already convicted murderer, Francois Holm, started. He testified for two and a half hours on the second day of trial. Now, Francis Holm was ultimately found guilty of the crime and sentenced to two life terms. In the years since, the French government gave Patrick Dills 1 million euros, of which he got to keep 70% in compensation for wrongful conviction. He also got a nice sum of money from the media outlet TF1 on the day of his release for an exclusive interview. Patrick Dills said, quote, I would have preferred to not touch a dime and not have been through all these hardships. It's not a jackpot like you get in the lottery. What I have experienced cannot be quantified. I can have blues, especially when I think of all those years that were stolen from me. I was in prison between 16 to 32 years old, a part that will never be returned to me. You can't reconstruct a cigarette that is burned down. Today, Patrick Dills works as a seasonal restaurant worker and is married and a father of two girls. Francis Holm remains in prison and has been convicted on nine murders, but has been suspected in killing many others. He currently is serving a 100-year prison sentence. He has adapted to the prison regime and has not had a disciplinary incident in 25 years. His sister told the media in 2017 that he has retired from prison work of putting staples in boxes and receives a disability allowance of around 200 euros, which allows him to eat for the week. 
He has his friends, he watches TV, he eats, and he waits. Chantelle Bignin, the mother of one of the boys murdered, died in late 2019. A lawyer for the Beckrich family stated in 2016, after the conviction of Francis Holm, quote, it is not the case which closes deafly, but leaves a bitter taste in the Beckridge family, was not convinced. Now the Beckridge family wants to stay in peace, but no longer has to comment on the guilt or innocence of one or the other. This completes the 20th episode of A Crime Story. Now, what do you think about this case? Do you think Patrick Dills is innocent or that Francis Holm committed the crime? You can comment on a crime story Instagram at a crime story pod where I will be posting images of today's story. You can even comment on a crime story podcast on Facebook or at a crime story pod on Twitter or even comment and see additional photos on a crime story podcast on YouTube. I am also on TikTok under the name A Crime Story Podcast. My website is a crimestorypodcast.com where you can listen to the podcast as well as read a transcript of today's story under the blog tab. The website includes a map of the different cases covered on this podcast underneath the episode slash case guide tab, so make sure to check it out. Thank you so much for listening. If you could please leave a review of the podcast, it helps others find the show. Also, if you could tell a friend about a crime story, I would greatly appreciate it. I hope to see you next time on December 16th, where I will be covering a case from Italy. You won't want to miss it. A Crime Story is created, hosted, written, and edited by me, Kaylin Lois. This episode for a crime story podcast was researched by me and Francois Tadivou. Sources for today's episode can be found on my website, acrimestorypodcast.com. The artwork for the show was created by Sabrina Smith. Theme music is by Ross Budgen. Additional story editing is brought to you by my father, Mike. Thank you so much for listening to A Crime Story, and stay safe at home and abroad.